Sometimes, things just matter. Like when help needs to get there quickly. When problems need urgent solutions. When small things are a big deal. When your big dream is just one step from reality, or new ways to grow are on the other side of the world, we know that behind every transaction is a purpose that matters. And it's why, together, we are making global finance move fast. With certainty. Wherever, whenever, and however it needs to go. For families, for economies, for all of us. For better. Hello and welcome to everyone to this LinkedIn Live session. Uh, my name is Simon Daniel. I'm a securities product manager at Swift. And today we're going to be exploring the latest in the settlement cycles. And I'm lucky to be joined by two uh, experts from the industry organization. So I have Alex Chow and Gary Wright. Alex, a quick word of intro from yourself first, please. Yeah, good pause before experts there, Simon. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm Alex Chow. I cover uh, investment operations policy at the IA, which is a trade body representing UK investment management. And I'm leading on our T plus one work. Thanks, Alex. And Gary, yourself? Yeah, well, I'm Gar Gary Wright. And uh, as you can see, I I've been uh, around a long time. I look like I've been around a long time. And I have been around a long time. And uh, running an operations for, for many years. And founder member of Visits of Europe and uh, now director of Visits of Europe. And also part of the T plus one research team that had uh, published a report earlier this year, commissioned by the Swift Institute. Thank you, Gary. So yeah, expertise and wisdom as well. So uh, in terms of today's session, so we do assume some familiarity with the topic. So we're going to focus very much on those recent updates from the last few months. Now, there's been a lot of preparation for the move in North America with active testing going on since August. Uh, in Europe, uh, ESMA's had several workshops and they have a call for evidence closing next week. Uh, in the UK, uh, UK Finance published their findings in August and the UK Task Force are looking to publish their report in the coming months as well. There's been a lot of other associations publishing as well as the, the members on this call, so such as AFME, ESA, EXTA. I can recommend those, topic, uh, those publications as being very detailed with some good thorough analysis, but it's also very much an international topic. So I think towards the end of November, we had the Securities and Exchange Board of India um, announcing a move to T0 same day uh, next March and looking at uh, a T0 instantaneous perhaps a year after that. So certainly lots of movements in all markets and jurisdictions. Uh, that US date is obviously narrowed a lot of focus. Um, so with that, um, I'm Again, happy to have Alex and Gary to call out those key areas. I'm going to start with yourself, Gary. So I know Azitzi have been running various roundtables on some of those key themes. Could you give me your insights? What, what was uh, talked about? What's one or two of those really main impactful areas? Right. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, um, uh, the Azitzi roundtables are, are, are designed a micro market. So they're, they were designed to cover uh, firms that, that span the uh, the supply chain uh, for transactions both internationally and domestically and uh, they're all done under chatham house rules so uh, people could speak very freely and they could um, provide their expertise and we broke uh, t plus one down into four uh, main areas uh, it's more areas than four believe me but uh, the four that we we uh, decided was uh, initiation um, would be one and the the main sort of uh, outcomes from those discussions was the the need for everybody to talk to each other um, or, uh, to speak to your counterparties to in your investors your clients to make them aware of any changes of, of uh, that, that you're introducing uh, to uh, operate in t plus one uh, and I think that's very important because uh, so far um, there, there's been a, a, a quite a, a dominance of sell side uh, presentations, very little 
coming back from the buy side. And uh, is it so Europe is trying to redress that balance a little bit by looking at this uh, in, uh, holistically and, uh, and very much with a buy side view? Um, so talk to each other and, and make people aware. Uh, concerns uh, were around uh, uh, data. Um, standard settlement instructions in particular and the uh, difficulties that, that firms are having in, in maintaining uh, 100% accuracy of, of, of uh, core data and accessing that data um, is also, uh, this, this sort of cuts across into the systems. Uh, they find it very difficult to access data in, a, in the time frame to which they, they, are, they are needed. And uh, I guess the third main uh, concern, uh, there was lots of concerns, but these are the ones I'm picking out, uh, is the time frame um, that to uh, introduce new systems is, is almost an impossibility uh, uh, with, with uh, such a short time to go. And uh, adapting uh, to uh, existing systems, existing process procedures is also a bit fraught where uh, large firms by and large are, are pretty well prepared and have done some testing. Uh, small to medium sized firms across the UK and EU, less so, in fact, uh, worryingly so, uh, not tested and, and in some cases completely not uh, unaware of, of uh, impacts to them um, personally and uh, expecting their brokers or their custodians uh, to get them out of the hole. Um, so that 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 is the, the, the biggest concern, I, I would say, that's come out of the round tables to date. Thank you. So yeah, awareness, technology, certainly dialogue with counterparties. Um, and then you referenced the buy side. So uh, Alex, maybe not uh, so in terms of your organization representing that sector, but also a little bit closer to the end investor as well. Can, can you elaborate on a couple of aspects for readiness? What, what are your members telling you or you hearing? Yeah, it's always a worry when people say the, the buy side of inquiry because that's kind of our, our job. But yeah, absolutely. In, in preparation for May 2024, um, in terms of the, the post-trade process, I guess that the, the big one is around the trade matching piece. Um, yep. So in terms of trade matching, previously you had the whole of T plus one to, to do that. Now you're looking between the, the close of the US day, 4 p.m. their time, which is 9 p.m. UK, 10 p.m. EU. Uh, and they're looking for affirmations by 9 p.m. US time, which is 2 or 3 a.m. So that 9 till 2 window in the UK, 10 till 3 in the EU, they're not standard operating hours for, for anyone without a, a US arm. Um, so firms are looking for where they've, they've got the, the allocations confirmations. They're using... Maybe they're using electronic matching platforms. Uh, they're looking at the proportion that don't go through there already and trying to, to resolve for those small bits. Um, although invariably there will be some exceptions to, to process on, on settlement date. The affirmation piece has been very new for quite a few EMEA and I'm sure APAC bodies as well. Um, so it's always ex existed in the US, but it's not always been, been known. So in some cases, affirmation rates have been quite low or unknown um, despite settlement being okay. Um, so buy side firms are, are looking to see how to do this, whether it's engaging with a custodian to get them to do it. There's a, a couple of very well-known products that, that can do it also, or some firms are looking at a combination of the two. Um, I think that the third piece here is if you're a US registered investment advisor, um, and again, not all of the firms I've spoken to initially knew whether they, they were or not. There is a register yeah. on the SEC website. You also need to keep books and records of those um, allocations, confirmations, affirmations as, as sent. So again, some firms are leaning on the custodian, looking at internal systems or using vendor platforms. Um, and just reiterating, Gary, um, yeah, our, our members have been speaking to brokers, to custodians to understand if there's any new um, deadlines, any new requirements given the, the trade matching piece. Um, and where they leverage middle office or asset servicing providers looking to make sure they're ready as well. So there's sort of interconnected parties across the chain, uh, which makes it very difficult. Yeah, certainly. So um, almost before the settlement cycle discussion on the timing, there was a lot of focus on current efficiency. So it's not like we're starting at 100% in terms of efficiency. So compression will exacerbate some of those existing problems. There's even some debate that we're moving the risk around or we're offsetting perhaps some credit risk versus operational risk as well, etc. So ju just in terms of some of the problems that cause impacts or friction points to settlement today. Um, I know some of the reports highlighted those. 
Um, Alex, could you cover a couple of those? Uh, what, what are the most common issues in those that initial post-trade process through to settlement? Yeah, I, I, I think people have probably heard it by now, but um, the, the biggest issues with T plus one are not the direct trade matching piece, although that's a very big build for the, for the buy side. It's some of these ancillary indirect impacts. Um, and I can list a, a few in the, the limited time we have. Um, so the first one is around uh, FX and cash management, probably the, the biggest concern for our members. Um, so today, if you're doing a, a North American security on T plus two, you're looking at conducting the FX usually on T plus one based on an aggregate amount of trades. Um, given that T plus one day is no longer going to be available, um, tends to be larger to medium sized firms are looking at US presence to con in instruct that FX end of US day. Um, firms without that US presence may be going to look to instruct it start of UK day in time for North American open. Um, both of those windows have a, a concern around current liquidity and what those spreads will look like. So there's a concern around cost to the investor. Um, tied to that is FX settlement. So there's a lot of advocacy at the moment to try and get PVP netting service providers, um, CLS, to, to yeah. move that cutoff <clears throat> by, by two yeah. hours. They have a survey open with their, their members looking at 30, 60, and 90 minutes. So our members are, are very keen for that to be pushed out and for the custodians, because our members don't face CLS directly, um, to also extend their deadlines or have friendlier deadlines. Um, cash flow and fund settlement, mutual funds in the UK and across Europe commonly settle T plus three or even T plus four. Um, so they're used to dealing with uh, capital markets on T plus two with a funding gap. Um, that becomes harder with T plus one um, and sort of tied to that wherever there's a global basket you've got a misalignment of cash flows um so if you're selling a european stock uh, you get a, your cash on t plus two you're buying us you need to pay for it on t plus one that's a one-day funding gap and all of these small funding gaps sort of build into a, a bigger funding cost that's uh, very much a concern um there's yeah. the market will be much more reliant on on these short-term funding funding costs um well, yes so, so just so just 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 to echo so obviously fx funding and cash management is probably cited as the number one biggest indirect impact so i, I completely concur also uh, in terms of the current the, the post trade process for a security settlement um what what are the friction points today we've got those economic or non economic mismatches gary was touching on the exchange of data and i think there's that timing element comes up as well so late instructions or late matching so as well as quality data it's the speed of getting that data through the party yeah. i just wanted to build on that bit so yeah gary would you echo that in your yeah yeah I, 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 would. I, I mean essentially we're, we're 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 trying to solve two major problems which are uh, really very difficult to resolve one one is uh, the whole industry including the csds operate on batch which means uh, that, that 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 creates the time uh, issue that you got, you've got to get things all in by a certain time and if you have one deadline a day on that batch it squeezes everything into get so half past nine new york time everything has to be in and across the world that, that the, these are very inconvenient hours the second uh, problem is literally the time, the, the fact the world turns around, um, that, that it's we're all operating um, on different time zones. And therefore, that, that uh, um, exacerbates the, the, the problems. If you put the two together, it makes it very, very difficult. Essentially, we're, we're on T plus one. We're, we're asking uh, um, operational settlement staff to, to work in a real-time processing environment because uh, we lose that day. It means that everything has to be done very, very close to the transaction time frame. Um, in in America, uh, about forty percent of the the uh, volume comes from uh, international markets. I think uh, uh, the EU is uh, is about twenty three percent, UK about thirteen percent, and the rest is uh, uh, Asia and around uh, dotted around the world. Um, so these 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 issues of of of, of of, um, of batching and time zones are, are, are fundamental and in, and almost insolvable. And uh, an example of that is CLS that has a cutoff time on FX. CLS doesn't operate for every single currency around the world. 
which means that that um, that there is already uh, uh, an issue about how do you actually pay. So if you can if you can get the stock moved, can you actually pay for it? Does it does the payments and the FX operate in the same same time frame? And how is that coordinated? Is that the custodians coordinating, or is that is that the uh, the investor or the broker? Um, pulling the strings to make it all happen. So, and all this in a, in a very, very short time frame. So uh, these are fundamental problems uh, that, you know, despite the, the business issues that we, we've, we touched on and the technical issues, these are fundamental issues that, that says, can you operate in this way? Is T plus one actually possible? Yeah, certainly so. And lots of, lots of impacts. I know Alex, you were building on that CLS comment and, and, CLS have their own deadline with the RTGS systems as well. And then in front of CLS, you've then got the custodian deadlines as well. So it's each layer almost having their own time limits as well. And any yeah. compression will, we even CLS moving, we need to see all, all elements, either moving more real time to your comment, Gary, or at least extending or doing more of that interim batch processing, et cetera. It, yeah. it's, it's, it, what, what it needs, uh, uh, Simon, is collaboration across the international markets. Um, where where this, is, this is going wrong is that the, the, an arbitrary date has been put on it by North America, uh, where the rest of the world is trying to, to um, you know, ch shuffle into place and, and, and adhere to that time frame. Um, but um, a, a more collaboration across, across uh, uh, CSDs internationally uh, and with the, the key structure firms that, 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 that support the, the transactions within the market is really what's required. And uh, uh, and I think we're we're, we're um, moving into a, a situation where the industry is creating a uh, um, a benefit, but where is that benefit uh, uh, actually accruing? Is that to the investor or is that elsewhere? It's not clear to me where the benefits actually lie. And in fact, uh, during the research for, for that we undertook undertook for the Swift Institute, uh, one of our early questions was about the investor benefits. Um, we we continue to ask the question. We continue to get no response. Yeah. Well, so to your point, collaboration is is key, and the benefits piece. And so, so, Alex, just to go back to you briefly. So we talked about the existing inefficiencies on whether it's exchange of SSIs, matching, inventory should be mentioned as well. We've now we've also covered obviously the FX cash funding piece as well, and and you were just starting to talk about some of the others, so that didn't mean to cut you. So corporate actions, ETFs, etc. Just maybe one minute on a couple of those other ones that are particularly prevalent, perhaps from the buy side you're hearing, but also everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so ETFs indeed very very much impacted. So they they track um, passively indices. Uh, many of these global indices have a. 60, 65% US weighting, 30, 35% EMEA APAC still on T plus two. Um, they, they work based on a, a create redeem cycle where everything's much easier if it's the same settlement cycle. Having that misalignment will cause additional costs, be it uh, cash, too much cash, so you get a fund performance drag, or whether it's, um, whether it's breaches as well. Um, SEC lending, we could very briefly touch on. How do you recall a stock that's out on loan to then settle on T plus one, especially if that's further rehypothecated? Uh, and indeed, corporate actions, I, I think, is one of those areas where our members know it's a problem, but it's, it's not maybe first order like uh, fund, fund, um, funding and FX. But indeed, you'll you'll get far fewer days to to look at exceptions um, potentially on depending on the type of corporate action. Your deadlines might be constrained, uh, et cetera. So. Minutes, not hours. Yes. If that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, can I just uh, make a comment on the stock lending borrowing? Um, of course, Gary. Uh, we had a, a round table uh, a couple of weeks ago on this. And um, I, I uh, uh, understood, and I think most people do, the, the issues around callbacks are, are, are the one that's taken highest profile. But what I hadn't appreciated until the round table is that. Um, the strategic use of stock lending and borrowing are go against the um, covering a short position, uh, and the, the strategy around stock borrowing uh, per different types of products. So ETFs being you know, just one one of those products, but there's an array of products where stock lending and borrowing are impacted, and uh, this is more complicated than than I think people have have, have looked at 
to date. And uh, the concern that I have around it is uh, not so much for the highly liquid stocks, um, but the mid cap stocks. If there is a a logjam in stock lending borrowing around mid caps and smaller, then liquidity in the market could be seriously affected. Um, And I I, I really do think that stock lending and borrowing needs to be looked at in a a lot lot more closely uh, as to what the the issues are to resolve, but how do you stop it having a liquidity impact in the market? Yeah, it's called securities financing for a reason. <laughs> so yeah. it, it helps add to that liquidity in the market. And yes, our, our colleagues and friends at ICMA, Alex, etc., are certainly uh, championing, working very hard on uh, bringing the data into that to, to make those data-driven decisions as well. Mm. Okay, so lots of and lots of impacts. Uh, we've covered some of those key ones. Um, let's try in terms of that being ready. So some recommendations. We don't have much time in terms of a new technology build. So we do have a sort of longer, le- uh, a longer eye in the future as more markets are considering this. But let's, uh, in terms of those recommendations, I'm just going to cover some of the work that Swift's done. So as part of our initiatives under smarter transactions, uh, we've been in- introducing new services like Securities View, but we've also been working with the industry around the unique transaction identifier, which helps support that settlement tracking, but also collaboration amongst all of the transaction parties. So it, it's a it's not a panacea, but it is a functional building block to enable that interoperability and exchange of data. It's a, a former ISO standard, obviously has a lot of history from transaction reporting, but we're certainly seeing its growing use to help support that trade lineage. Um, and it's interesting, the call for Exeter, so that they're looking for firms to provide data and uh, STP ratios. It's a lot, there isn't a lot of nice, clean quality data in the settlement space. So it's certainly a big enabler for that. And with CSDR penalties in the first year, about one and a half billion credits and debits, it's, it's certainly a large number. And so it's certainly part of that business case that a the use of a shared reference among participants can certainly drive that transparency and lineage. Uh, so, uh, Alex or Gary, whoever would, could anyone could I review comment quickly on some of the benefits from that visibility, yeah, I, Gary? Yeah. I, I um, totally support the the uh, the uh, intention of UTI, and I think it's a it's a, a a good starting point to to tackle some of the other other issues around uh, reference data and the, and the the um, and and the assess, um, the the quality and accessibility of that data on an international scale. So, uh, I think every firm should should have a good good hard look at it um, because this this is uh, um, well worth um, looking at as a strategic uh, development uh, based in and around real time processing. And and it does fulfil some um, some of the um, some of the needs that I think uh, buy side firms uh, especially. Um, would benefit from that the, the, the yeah the visibility is very important so as a buy side firm often you're facing a global custodian to sub custodian to csd so all of these settlement messages have to go right through the chain before you and then back down before you see see what's wrong so if you do have that that visibility that potentially something like this could offer then maybe you're able to update your ssis quicker or the the trade data etc so um yeah early days but um yeah, tooling like this could certainly help. Speed and data. We were talking earlier um, about how when it's STP and trades flow through and it's happy day, then th- th- then we don't need that intervention. But I think particularly, where is the cost in these post-trade activities? There's also sunk cost in technology, which is, uh, but that the, the human cost is often focused on exceptions. And so mm-hmm. that's where you need to, engage with those counterparties, better exchange of data. So let's try and clean up and get them that drive the quality data. Okay, so as well as uh, those, uh, some of those functional applications, so there's various papers, the playbooks as well, which are very good in terms of laying out some of the options that people can take. We've talked about different workflows, the affirmation, auto-affirmation models, etc. cetera. Um, there were, I think there were a total of 10 recommendations in the recent AFMI paper. Um, Alex, would you like to cover just a couple that firms could consider short and long term? Because I, I do think it's a sense that more markets will do this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, agree. Not not enough time to, to go through all of them, or indeed uh, any that the, the buy side may have separately. Or, but yeah, indeed, I think some of them center around um, information to be supplied on trade date itself. So not using that day in between, not using settlement date. Uh, I think everyone can get behind that. And if the UK and EU do transition, that's likely going to be one of the requirements that everything's done on trade date. Um, I think there's a, a recommendation around um, some of these settlement efficiency tools becoming more available. So things like auto partialing, uh, it really helps yep. the industry where there's homogeneity. So everyone offers the the same thing so that you, you can you can choose to, to opt into something knowing your 20 different global custodians are all facilitating it. Um, so things like that are helpful. Um, and indeed, the last thing I've mentioned is maybe greater visibility around inventory, which will be particularly key for... EMEA. So in the US, it's not such a big problem, but in EMEA, we hold stock in uh, domestic locations in France or at an ICSD, such as Euroclear or Clearstream. So having that full visibility will be will be key, having all that info before before the instruction goes. Yep. You, you mentioned there's a few tools in the in the toolbox, so partialing, etc. That's another good one. And that Swedish case study was quite informative for benefits from auto partialing. G Gary, a couple of others from yourself in terms of uh, maybe more on that settlement piece? Yeah, uh, um, I think if what we should be looking at is creating the environment uh, in the UK and Europe for T plus one or real time processing to operate. Uh, I don't. I don't think a big bang approach actually works. Uh, so I think what what we need to do is look at how we can get uh, trade matching confirmations allocations all brought forward to as close to the um, transaction execution time as possible. Um, now uh, it could be, and some of the roundtables have talked about having a regulatory need to, to to motivate this to happen and uh, and it may well be that that um, the regulators need to um, take part more in, in in helping the environment to be created but get get all your data into your your systems as early as you possibly can get it work towards a hundred percent eliminate any paper uh, in the UK that includes paper certificates but elsewhere if anyone um, I, I heard uh, there's an event uh, in the US about uh, how do we get rid of facts well heaven help us you know if we've got facts <laughs> we're, in, we're in a bigger mess than I thought we would be um, but uh, um, but get rid of any any paper any 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 paper that's in part of your process eliminate it so you to create the environment where you're operating in a in a in a near real time uh, process. That's that's what I would ask all firms to to have a look at, and don't wait for the report, of the task force report, or the ESMA report. Um, it's whatever you do um, for North America moving, you're going to have to do it at some stage in the UK and and in, in the EU in any hail. So start now. Start that that looking at that that uh, what you need to do to uh, eliminate paper. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I'd, I'd hope most of our audience have already started an impact analysis, but that's a great question to throw in. Are there any paper processes today be it in some strange, uh, some uh, indirect, maybe collateral posting or something? So that's a, that's a good one to call out. Um, Alex? Briefly, what, what do you expect for the next year, uh, maybe after the North America move? Actually, I do know, so um, the EU Council have just approved the CSDR rewrite as well. So we'll, we may get some technical changes deploy, uh, delivered in the next uh, month or so around CSDR. So there's, even that is possibly on the horizon. But what, any guidance, what, what would you imagine in your crystal ball for next year after the US move? Yes. So first five months preparing for May 2024. Um, after that, hopefully the market can see how, how well it's gone. Um, it should be should be quite clear at the moment. It, it looks costly for, for EMEA investors and APAC investors, but hopefully as time goes on, we'll, we'll see whether there's, there's benefits and how they work. Um, we'll also start to see whether the UK and EU moving in line with them would be good or bad. I think there's quite a lot of mixed views on that at the moment. Um, so for any market participants, I encourage you to start thinking about how Europe and UK would move for T plus two and putting those views to your to your trade bodies to then put to, to these negotiations. Yes, I yeah. think most most don't want uh, different different go lives in in all the different jurisdictions. I, I think the most most investment ops uh, people's uh, idea of hell is 
all the different Euros, European jurisdictions to go at different time, times and dates is, uh, yeah, is, is difficult. And Gary, you reference stages as well. So not necessarily move on one date, but let's improve the post-trade bit first, perhaps, yes. and then there's something. Yeah, nib- what else would you add as a... Yeah, nib- nibble away at the at the problem. Don't try and do everything all at once. Uh, try and in- introduce uh, benefits so you get you you accrue uh, benefits as as we go along. Um, also, uh, um, look at this as st- strategy as much as anything else, um, because although we talk a lot about technology uh, in T plus one, we talk about working faster and doing things. There's also benefits. There's business benefits that can come out of this as well. Um, so firms could, should be looking at, at where can you improve your customer services around T plus one? How can you uh, um, not just reduce costs and risks, but how can you improve the services? Yeah. yeah, the opportunity side. Uh, and I think there's a there's a tendency whenever you get get any any uh, industry wide change within the market, we all concentrate very much on trying to get past the line and, and making things happen. But these things do throw up opportunities, and I can almost guarantee you. Uh, because uh, uh, having worked in the capital markets most of my life, I know that people will look be looking there and say, "Well, there's a new product we can create here. There's a new new opportunity. There's a new something new we can offer the the investor." So I'm, I'm pretty sure that that something like that will materialise as we we go through uh, coming years. Um, but uh, you've got to start now. You know, it, it's it's never too late. Um, just get going. Perfect. So I know we're almost up, so I'm going to get just a quick time. We do have a few questions coming in, so I'm just going to uh, turn to one of those. So hello, Mr. Walsh. Good to hear from you. So we have a question about uh, new accounts from the buy side and the inevitable due diligence in the process. So there's account opening. There's also diligence in terms of credit checks, perhaps, through the, through the process. How is that those functions going to be impacted by T1? Again, less time. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's crucial, right, that for any new account openings, given you don't have this T plus one data to fix everything, that all the SSIs need to be on place, everything's fully onboarded, and that the, the clients provided all of the data necessary on, on setup before then being allowed to trade. Of course, then you have the the pressure from uh, from client relationship and from the front office <laughs> to, to, to allow that. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to be managing that that sort of relationship there. But it, it will be crucial. Yeah. Yep. Big, big problem. Good. Big problem. Uh, need to have a look at that because it's got to be a lot better than what it is today. And just, just for maybe, I think it's almost certainly another topic for a different session. But T zero. <laughs> So T zero instant, T zero atomic, T zero simultaneous. Well, well, my I, I... comment just just to have that is, I believe T one is more a revolution, an evolution. T zero is more a revolution so well, go ahead uh, gary the, the the you know we we work in a service industry for for clients and uh, our clients are investors and issuers um are they asking for faster settlement or are they asking for cheaper risk less risk settlement um and so i'm i'm wondering why why are we actually doing this uh t plus zero makes no sense whatsoever um because uh, even if you had the technology to do it um would the good good test go and ask your investor? Would you like to pay an extra, I don't know, ten quid to have your 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 transaction settle in real time? I, I would imagine that they would say, I don't care. Um, I, I want just it want it to be settled, and I want it to be settled. Not 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 how fast it's going to be settled, unless you're going to t- you know, make it cheaper for me and it's less risky. Yeah, you know, it doesn't impact me. Yeah, I would say on this, Simon, just very quickly, uh, I sure. think at the start of the ESMA call for evidence coming out, people mostly dismissed T plus zero as requiring whole new infrastructure. I think yeah. over the last couple of weeks, I have heard a few participants say if the EU is going to take till 2029, 2030 for T1, maybe it should consider T zero. I think at the moment, that's still a niche minority uh, argument, but we, we are, seeing, we are see, seeing people discuss it. So I'll just put it out there. Brilliant. Well, no, it's still spot part of a landscape. So we're all very much interested in value, resiliency, stability, risk offset. Time Dora. is a key factor. Exactly. Dora to mention it. Um, so of, 
I think we all want to ensure the safe, secure markets for the good of everybody. And that doesn't necessarily mean speed is the answer. So we need to be deploying this sensibly with wisdom and expertise and in a staged manner to ensure benefit for all. And do try and remember the end investor as much as possible. So I think I'm over time. I want to thank you, Alex and Gary. Very much appreciated. And to all the audience who are out there, if you're listening live or on, repeat, on recording, um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.